You are listening to the Cattle Call Podcast. This is the place where computer-aided design and drafting meets humor and practicality, with a touch of business acumen thrown in for fun. Jim and Rocco, the owners of Zentech Consultants, the premier U.S. technology consulting firm for architecture, engineering, construction, and manufacturing, discuss the fascinating world of CAD with some humor and some honesty. The Cattle Call Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Cattle Call Podcast with Jim and Rocco from Zentech Consultants. I am Jim, your witty and charming host, and with me, as he always is, is my partner. This is Rocco. I'm just, you know, I, I got to find a way to get these people to communicate to me that, you know, that all it's all these, all these, you know, nice adjectives that you say or crazy adjectives, they're not true. They're, they're absolutely true. Wait, are you saying I am not witty and charming? No, you're certainly not charming. <laughs> I'm a bit I of think a... your wife would agree. <laughs> and my wife would use words that we can't use. This is a public broadcast. That's not nice. The children might be listening. <laughs> you don't want to know the words she uses for me. <laughs> so, all right. All right. So because Rocco has insulted me and tells me I'm not witty and charming, that means I must make him suffer through the engineering joke of the week. Yes, Rocco. You don't get away from it just by being mean. I just, it makes me do more. So you're just not helping your own cause here. All right, Rocco, so here's, <laughs> here's your joke, right? How many nuclear engineers does it take to change the light bulb? How many? Seven. One to install the new bulb and six to figure out what to do with the old ones for the next 10,000 years. Ah, <laughs> ah, come on. Come on, get it. That gets, the, that gets the drum sound effect. There it goes. <laughs> That's an awful joke. <laughs> uh, all right, folks, so... We wanted to start a new event here on the Cattle Call, and we call it This Month in Design Build. Um, and this is where we take a look at what new and exciting things have happened recently in our industry that are out in the news. Um, and we're going to try and do this every month. Uh, and our intent is to focus primarily, as we always do, on the tech side of the construction and the engineering world. Uh, but you know, we're, we'll see where the news actually takes us, right? There's, there's no rule here that says we can't go down either, you know, the business or the financial road um, as they relate to our industries. Um, we'll just have to see where things go. Uh, look, you know, not, not only does it keep us all who are listening here up to date on the cool new things happening around the world, I think it also dumps some of the responsibility for topics and discussion points back onto Rocco's shoulders for a change. Uh, and you see why I'm not charming here, Rocco, because I'm doing all the work. <laughs> I'm tired of coming up with all the podcast topics around here while he sips my ties out of his beach house. So, uh huh. Uh huh. So, what are you which, saying, man? Which, which beach house? Which uh, one? See, right, dead, dead. Well, yeah, it's my ties at the Hawaii one, right? And then the, the the one that you have in the Belgian Congo is is. <laughs> I don't know what you drink out there. You've never invited me to that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, what are you saying, man? These these episodes are going to be based around news articles. You're going to actually do some work for a change and and find us some. Uh, topics and help a brother out here uh, i'll see what i can do i'll see what i can do i'll tell you what if you can get me some more of those ice cream sandwiches that you got me for christmas i'll, I'll, I'll be nice to you see, bribery goes a long way it's amazing what you can get through with a little ice cream sandwich <laughs> if i had known that's all it took to make him do some work i'd have given him a lifetime supply so, all right so let's start this let's start with an article that i saw uh on on using digital twin technologies for the infrastructure space um, now, apparently, uh, Bentley Systems, they, they've been out there, they've been doing a lot in this space, apparently, and, and they've been having a field day getting into um, the large format construction space, right, using digital twins to develop and model and test and maintain kind of federated data, we'll call it, long term. And they've been working on some just absolutely massively huge projects around the world. Uh, the one that caught my eye in particular is that they are involved in working on ITER, that's I-T-E-R, and it stands for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. Um, you know, these guys are, are helping to develop nuclear fusion, right, which is the holy grail of energy production. Um, and the thing that's interesting here for us, I think, is that, you know, the folks working on this concept, they are using uh, digital twins of reactors that actually haven't been built yet. They're, they're you know, proposed experimental reactors where they can you know, run, you know, analyses and tests and so on of, of all the potential processes and, and 
you know, it helps them to predict the results and what would happen and what are the energy levels and what are the, the you know, radiation levels and so on. Um, and I think that that kind of concept, to my mind, is, is the big process change that we're seeing moving into the digital twin age, right? I think it's really much more about predictive modeling, right, combined with in integration, I guess, of, of real world conditions that it gives us an arena to organize and optimize all of our different design options, right? Even down to things like the cost of materials and so on on a construction job, right? Or projecting HVAC costs over the next 10 years. I think that, you know, digital twins in infrastructure in particular, um, it's also going to let us incorporate siloed data. Um, that most of the time gets left behind in, in our current, you know, we'll call it our traditional file-based design process, right? You work in the, in the civil infrastructure space, you know, you think about all the models and all the reports and all the design settings and all the, the output that we deal with during the design build phase of, of, a, of a project, right? When, when that project is done, when it's built, okay, we turn over to the client and all the InfraWorks and the, the utilities, everything is done, the building's up. All that data just dies, right, um, at the end of the build. And with digital twins, those designs live inside the model. The, the idea is that they become this active, living, breathing function where we can add to and update more information over the life of the system or the facility that you put up. Um, and I think this has a ton of potential for some game-changing stuff in the infrastructure space, right? Where we can really begin to kind of blend public and private data, you know, GIS and individual buildings and underground utilities and, you know, everything under the sun, right? Roads and so on uh, into extensive data resources at, at both the municipal and even the state level. Um, so Rocco, you, you read this article too, right? What did you pull from it? Um, and, and how do you think that they're the industry, I guess, is kind of positioning digital twins for real world use versus kind of the, the Facebook Metascape type pitches we've been hearing about digital twins. Yeah, you know, it, it, this isn't a topic that's that we certainly discuss very often with our with our customers. Right. But it, it, it's certainly in the news a lot. And we've um, we've actually done a, a, a podcast or two with um, Ken D'Amato um, to, to talk about this concept and. I, from from my perspective, it's it's something that's kind of out there, you know. Um, it, it it's not in the everyday mindset, but you know, I I I found it interesting. I mean, particularly the the point about um, you know using digital twins to reduce the um, the 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 footprint. Um, you know that I thought that's that's important. And then you know they made the point about reducing costs of materials. I, I'm not sure that I understand how that how that really translate, you know, with with how much the cost of materials fluctuate from day to day. Um, so some some points I thought were were interesting, particularly again around the carbon footprint. But um, I don't I don't know, you know. I think with with time we'll we'll, we'll see how all this. Yeah, you'll definitely. See. I mean, I think the the big mindset behind that in terms of how it, it saves money is the you know instead of. I think because of the lead time and, and the delay that we see a lot of times for things like steel or windows and, and different, you know, aluminum windows versus, you know, bronze cladding versus, you know, plastic, et cetera, that you can easily shift the materials, make sure in the digital model there. So aluminum, for some reason, the prices go through the roof. Well, it's going to be two years before that gets delivered. So you budgeted a hundred dollars a window and now they're $8,000 a window. You know, you can, you can go into the digital twin and say, hey, can we do the same thing, get the same result, get the same look with, you know, a vinyl clad window instead that's still at only $110 a window. You know I mean? That, that's what I mean in, in reduction of materials and, and costs and so on. That's kind of how they see that. It gives you a, an experimental place where you can make changes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that kind of ties into the next article uh, that I saw here a little bit, right? I saw an article on uh, uh, Gensler's design forecast for 2023. Um, and it, it really caught my imagination, right? Because they, what they were doing here is they identified the top 10, what they're calling, you know, mega trends uh, that they see coming for the design build world. And they are all focused around changing the types of buildings and societies that we live in. Um, there is a huge focus on developing what they refer to as the three M's, right? They call it mobility, 
multifamily and multi-purpose designs. Um, you know, and, and according to, to Gensler's research across the 80 or so countries that they work in, uh, the focus is shifting almost everywhere to, you know, uh, putting the focus on, on both personal and communal life focused spaces that are allowing for simpler, smaller, more convenient and eco-friendly designs that give people more opportunities to interact, I guess, as a community and, and, and to have living spaces that are far simpler than what we've kind of become used to over the last century. Um, you know, they're, they're seeing a mass change in the mentality of the people living and working in these spaces and, and that the design requirements are changing to meet those new needs and desires. Um, you know, people are looking for accessible communities, right? Where things like you know, walking paths and eco-friendly gardens and easily accessible healthcare and lifestyle support systems are all integrated, um, you know, as opposed to our current, or we'll call it the old model of, of the individual home and apartment and, and, you know, office and commercial properties, everything working is kind of like distinct islands and, and you have to get in a car and travel to where they are and, and they're not in any way working together. Um, and, and there is a huge push on developing, you know, we'll call them mini towns, um, you know, where the office spaces and the retail and the residential um, all coexist in either the same or in a small collection of buildings that are connected in some way with walkways and so on that support and integrate with each other by design. Um, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a throwback, I think, to the idea of small villages, right, that we saw, you know, early on in human development, I guess. Um, but, but the idea is to have these villages that are highly connected with really advanced utilities and internet and social support services and gardens and public spaces. Um, so it's, it's, I, I find it really interesting because, you know, Rocco, you know, I, I've seen a lot of these types of communities actually popping up around me down here at the Jersey Shore. Um, are, are, are you seeing these near you or, or in the industry? And, and, you know, in general, what are your thoughts about the concept? Yeah, I mean, not so much near me. I'm in a more populated area of, of New Jersey. And, um, you know, so it, it's, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't really know if, if I hear many people talk about them. I mean, I think the concept is, is pretty neat. You know, I mean, from a pandemic standpoint, people being closer to one another, is that so much a good thing? <laughs> I, I don't know. But, you know, uh, let's uh, hope that we keep trending out of the pandemic, right? But I mean, I, I you know, I wonder, I thought the article was interesting. And I, I wonder even just from an overall uh, social standpoint, I, I could see the benefits, right? I mean, I think people are generally happier when they're around more people and and they interact with people more, you know, versus just being in their, their little homes and behind their computers all day, you know, on Zoom calls. So I think that there's there's a social benefit there that it, of course, wasn't talked about in, in a you know in a design related article, but uh, it I think it's worth uh, analyzing that standpoint alone. Yeah, that we're we're seeing a huge jump in here. We got two or three of these you know little mini town communities you know around here, and they're they're actually really cool. We actually you know my wife and I hit there and go there for dinner because it's basically they're like little we'll call them like outside malls, right? So basically like the, the ground floors are restaurants and shops and gyms and daycare centers and all the things that, that you would need, right? So you can walk down, get your paper, walk across, pick up your groceries, drop the kids off at daycare. And and then above them are all, uh, you know, five, six story condos, right? For the residential life. And those are all connected with, you know, uh, skyways and cross bridges. It's a whole completely different way of, of working and people just absolutely love it. Most of them are built, obviously, you know, right up against, you know, the boardwalk and the beaches and stuff. And so you've got literally everything. People don't even have to have cars. You know, they're like I said, they're like little mini cities. So it's a cool concept. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break here to get a word in from our sponsors. All right, but stand by. We'll be back with more in just a minute here on the Cattle Call Podcast. All right, everybody. Today's Cattle Call Podcast is being sponsored by both Rocco and I. Uh, Zentech, we want to talk to you guys about our Blue Beam Review Toolset Kickstart program. Uh, look, do you guys fight with trying to get reliable, repeatable 
quantity takeoff and markup items from your Bluebeam software, right? Are you guys frustrated having to go in and change and modify the display properties of every single item that you create inside a review? Well, that's what we're here to help you guys with the Kickstart program. Uh, we give you tools that you need built to your specifications at an affordable fixed cost. Um, you can fully develop tool sets for any industry. Doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter what you do, we can help you work better with Bluebeam custom tools. So Rocco, why don't you tell folks how they uh, get info on our Kickstarter program? Yeah, the big thing is it is, like you said, Jim, it's one fixed price. So it's $29.95 uh, and uh, we can help you to, to, to prove to your management uh, what, is it, what the- Is it $29.95? No, Jim, it's 2,995 dollars. Thank you, just wanted to clarify. <laughs> oh, of course. So hit up our website, check out the details. We'd be happy to talk to you. It's uh, zentechconsultants.net. Reach out to us, sales at zentechconsultants.net or give us a ring, 866-824-4459. All right, the Bluebeam Review Toolset Kickstart Program. Everything you guys need to be Bluebeam experts. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Cattle Call Podcast. We're doing a monthly industry news recap today. Um, to kind of keep you guys thinking and conversing about what's going on in the design and build world. Um, and the next topic that I want to hit on today is, uh, it's an article that I saw from Dodge Reports on the growth of prefab and modular construction. Um, and now look, you know that that is hardly a new concept and most of us, I think, understand the benefits of modular builds. Um, but I think that, you know, design, project management, and even estimating technologies, right? A lot of the stuff that Rocco and I work with every day have, have advanced to the point where we're capable of doing you know, a lot more in this arena than most of us think. Uh, you know, when I talk to folks about, you know, prefab construction, there still seems to be a misunderstanding uh, that we're talking about, you know, modular homes and prefab warehouse type buildings that are, you know, low end and cheap to make and, and you make them look fancy and sell them to knuckleheads. Um, and, and, and that's not what we're talking about. What this article is talking about is, is a change in the overall building process, right? Using modular concepts um, and not necessarily building on the factory floor and then trucking it in whole to a site. That's not what we're, we're discussing. We're talking about the ability to use, you know, uh, building information modeling and, and advanced estimating and advanced QTO techniques and tools to be able to calculate and count and verify and order materials that are, are cut to predefined sizes and shapes, right? And then you have them bundled and labeled and delivered to your job site at the appropriate time, right? So you don't have to, to store them, right? And then you have them dropped in the appropriate location on your site for your workers to use. Um, you know, I mean, in this concept, it can mean, you know, efficiency increases worth hundreds of billions with a B, hundreds of billions of dollars in savings across the construction industry every year Right? And, and it provides better outputs with you know, greater safety for your workers and your users on the project. Um, and and, and you know, another thing that the article really focused on, which that was really interesting, is that this adds, it, it has a lot of environmental benefits in that we're reducing a lot of the waste because everything's pre-cut, pre-sized. We're not you know, taking huge pieces, cutting them down and throwing things away. Um, it, it dramatically cuts down on emissions, right? Dust and particles and, and particulates floating through the air on our job sites, which is always a concern. Um, and it dramatically reduces power usage for construction sites, right? So it's a huge, huge impact on dropping the carbon footprint to get into this type of modular construction. Um, you know, so Rocco, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with construction folks in, in both you know, the BIM and Bluebeam sites. Uh, on helping them you know, optimize their material sizing and ordering processes, part of that you know QTO and, and prep process. Um, is is this something that you you are seeing is more widespread, or do you think it's just you know the the contractors and folks that we're dealing with who are, are looking at this? No, I think it goes it goes well beyond contractors. I mean, you know, we're we're doing work with with folks that are within infrastructure and and building product manufacturing. 
Um, so it, it, it definitely extends beyond that. You know, I thought the, the other um, area that was interesting about the article was that um, the, the quality uh, of, of the output is, is also better and stronger. Um, you know, so that in addition to all those other points that you mentioned, uh, I, I thought I thought quality is is important. Obviously, everybody wants a good quality output. You know, you don't want cheap crap. You yeah. know, that's going to fall apart. So um, you you do get quality with with modular. Yeah, no, I mean you think about it, right? You you're getting things like I said delivered at the time you need them in the, the you know instead of you know your 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 lumber for your job sitting out in the rain and the snow and the mud for eight months warping and, and rotting and, you know, freezing and thawing and, you know, you're getting your fresh from the factory cut to size, dry on a, on a truck, brought right to the floor you need it on. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. So yeah, the quality is going to be dramatically better. It's a good point. Um, okay. So the, um, I will say this, right? I'm going to get my last article here. And it was a bit of news that, that kind of really caught my attention this month. I just, this really sparked my imagination. Um, and it was an article from Construction Drive that, it, it talks about the lack of growth in the commercial construction market for 3D printing. Um, now, look, we're talking here about large construction level printing, right? Not the manufacturing scale printers for making, you know, little cheap plastic shoes for hobbyists and crap like that. Um, you know, the, the Rocco has one of those and he prints himself his own Crocs and he, and he wears them with black socks, mm -hmm. which is just awful. You got to stop, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so look, you know, there, there have been a lot of, of residential, uh, home developments throughout the world that are being done using these large scale 3d printers. And they're incredibly fast. They're clean, they're reliable and eco-friendly. Um, and they're absolutely amazing at providing, you know, low income and emergency housing in just a matter of hours, right? It's got a, a huge benefit there. Um, you know, and there's been a complete failure of these tools though making their way into the commercial market. Right? And, and that's what this article really hit on. Um, and, and I've asked that question myself and, and, and you know, why, are, why isn't this happening yet? And I assumed that it was cost related, right? That, you know, the 3D printers for large scale construction, they either cost just way too much or the commercial construction just was too, um, you know, complex and they weren't, you know, able to handle it. Uh, but apparently, that's not the case, right? Apparently the biggest issue that is holding this industry back, right? And, and, and you know, keeping us from, from making this massive change that seems it should be for the better across the boards is actually code enforcement, uh, which had never occurred to me, right? There, apparently there's been a huge pushback against 3D printing by government agencies. Uh, you know, th their concern is that, you know, a lot of the trade work in this, this 3D printing process is done at once by the printer as an integrated part of their printing process, right? You know, for example, all of your, you know, your structural components and your utility raceways and all of your wiring and your walls and your rebar, they're all going in at exactly the same time in these printing processes, right? As opposed to the, you know, the traditional, you know, you do one thing at a time and wait for inspections and approvals, right? You know, that process we all know and love so much. Um, you know, where you, you know, put in all of your rebar and then wait for it to be inspected. Then you pour your concrete and then you wait for it to dry and then it gets inspected. And then, you know, you put up your foundation and you wait for it and then they get inspected. I, they, I guess there's, there's a concern that the integrity of the build is being entirely pushed into machines without the benefit of, of human inspection. I, and there is, you know, uh, this, this 3d building Pro, you know, printing process, it's going to require, I think, kind of a fundamental change in how buildings are approved and inspected. Um, the big thing here, right, is it's going to come down to liability, right? And we're going to have to move the liability for the output of these buildings and the reliability of the final product to the printing companies, right? And, and we're going to have to integrate that with, you know, so that they're not cutting corners or using cheaper materials than what's spec. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're going to have to put a little bit more onus on the architects and engineers where they're going to have to go out and they're going to have to verify not just the, the traditional construction documents like they do now with their signatures and seals, but they're also going to have to certify the BIM model, right? And the CNC controls, right? The, the, the uh, 
What does CNC stand for? Right? Was it command? Not command and control. So, oh, my years in the military. I always forget what it stands for. Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, it's the control files yeah. that tell them yeah. how to print and, and you know additive and subtractive stuff. I, I always lose that. But you know the the, the architects and engineers are going to have to verify those as well that they meet up with the design. Um, you know we may even need to shift to having inspectors on site in real time during the printing process to verify that the machines are following code. Um, you know, and, and it's a really interesting debate, I think, on you know when and where technology needs to override human interaction and control. Uh, so, you know, Rocco, what do you think the fallout of this will be from you know the government side, and and maybe more importantly, um, do you think that that this concept of three D printing is going to run into issues in terms of you know union and labor concerns as the the printing capabilities here develop? Yeah, I mean, union and labor, you know, that's just, in my opinion, anyway, that's trying to change the, the mindset of the masses. And I think with time, you can certainly do that. Um, I, I think I think the bigger challenge is 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 government and trying to trying to change their processes and get government to move. Right. Um, and it all comes down. I mean, who comprises the government? It's people. But it just government's bigger, slower, and more and more people involved. So uh, it, it just, it, I think the, the larger, the, the more the masses, the, the slower things move. But, you know, I, I think as a whole, as a society, we're all out for improving, right? Improvement in, in, in life and in everything that we do. And, and I, I think that there's, there's a better way here, um, but it involves changing processes, that's for sure. And like I said, you know, move, moving the government, I remember one of my old sergeants in the army used to tell me that trying to get the government to change his mind was like trying to shift a mountain with a toothpick. I mean, you can do it, but it's going to be one grain of sand at a time. It's going to take a while, <laughs> but it, when you keep doing it, you'll eventually get there. Um, it takes more than one lifetime, I'm guessing though. Um, all right. So, well, there you have it, folks. That's our initial installment of, you know, this month in design build. Uh, it's complete. And I hope we've giving you guys something to talk about. And we'll do this again next month. You know, uh, assuming I can get Rocco to take a break from his, you know, luxury spa days and shoot me over some articles to read and talk about. All right, folks, we will get out of here and we'll catch you next time on the Cattle Call Podcast. All right, everybody, today's Cattle Call was brought to you courtesy of Zentech Consultants. That's Rocco and I. Uh, Zentech Consultants works with design and manufacturing firms to help our clients purchase and implement the software that they need in these complex industries. Uh, we provide a single point of contact for clients to buy, develop, and learn the most vital software systems for your specific needs. Uh, Zentech strives to be your trusted technology partner from your initial needs all the way through long-term support and training for your entire staff. So Rocco, why don't you tell them how to reach out to Zentech? All right, yeah, you can reach out to us through zentechconsultants.net. You can email us at sales at zentechconsultants.net, or you can even call us, 866-824-4459. Excellent. We look forward to hearing from you all.